Hi guys, we're here for a Bible in a Year challenge reading. We are on June 23rd today. That is going to be read from 2 Chronicles chapters 1 through 3, Psalm chapter 78 verses 25 through 48, and 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Okay, so 2 Chronicles chapter 1. Solomon asks for wisdom. Solomon, the son of King David, now took firm control of the kingdom, for the Lord his God was with him and made him very powerful. He called together all Israel, the generals and captains of the army, the judges, and all the political and clan leaders. Then Solomon led the entire assembly to the hill at Gibeon, where God's tabernacle was located. This was the tabernacle that Moses, the Lord's servant, had constructed in the wilderness. David had already moved the Ark of God from kiriath Jerem to the special tent he had prepared for it in Jerusalem. But the bronze altar made by Bezalel, son of Uri, and grandson of Hur was still at Gibeon in front of the tabernacle of the Lord. So Solomon and the people gathered in front of it to consult the Lord. There in front of the tabernacle, Solomon went up to the bronze altar in the Lord's presence and sacrificed a thousand burnt offerings on it. That night God appeared to Solomon in a dream and said, What do you want? Ask, and I will give it to you. Solomon replied to God, You have been so faithful and kind to my father David, and now you have made me king in his place. Now, Lord God, please keep your promise to David, my father, for you have made, a, made me king over a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. Give me wisdom and knowledge to rule them properly, for who is able to govern this great nation of yours? God said to Solomon, Because your great... Your greatest desire is to help your people, and you did not ask for personal wealth and honor, or the death of your enemies, or even a long life, but rather you asked for wisdom and knowledge to properly govern my people. I will certainly give you the wisdom and knowledge you requested, and I will also give you riches, wealth, and honor, such as no other king has ever had before you, or will ever have again. Then Solomon returned to Jerusalem from the tabernacle of the hill of Gibeon, and he reigned over Israel. Solomon built up I think the dog's still outside. The dog was scratching on the door. I left him outside on accident. Okay. Solomon built up a huge military force, which included 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses. He stationed many of them in the chariot cities and some near him in Jerusalem. During Solomon's reign, silver and gold were as plentiful in Jerusalem as stones, and valuable cedar wood was as common as the sycamore wood that grows in the foothills of Judah. Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt and from Sicilia. The king's traders acquired them from, from Sicilia at the standard price. At that time, Egyptian chariots delivered to Jerusalem could be purchased for 600 pieces of silver, and horses could be bought for 150 pieces of silver. Many of these were then resold to the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Aram. Chapter 2, Preparations for Building the Temple Solomon now decided that the time had come to build a temple for the Lord in a loyal, royal palace for himself. He enlisted a force of 70,000 common laborers, 80,000 stonecutters in the hill country, and 3,600 foremen. Solomon also sent this message to King Hiram at Tyr. Send me cedar logs like the ones that were supplied to my father David when he was building his palace. I am about to build a... temple to honor the name of the Lord my God. It will be a place set apart to burn incense and sweet spices before him, to display the special sacrificial bread, and to sacrifice burnt offerings each morning and evening on the Sabbaths, at new moon celebrations, and at the other appointed festivals of the Lord our God. He has commanded Israel to do these things forever. This will be a magnificent temple because our God is an awesome God, greater than any other. But who can really build him a worthy home? Not even the highest heavens can contain him. So who am I to consider building a temple for him, except as a place to burn sacrifices to him? So send me a master craftsman who can work with gold, silver, bronze, and iron, someone who is an expert at dyeing purple, scarlet, and blue cloth, and a skilled engraver who can work with the craftsmen of Judah and Jerusalem who were selected by my father David. Also send me cedar, cypress, and almug logs from Lebanon, for I know that your men are without equal at cutting timber. I will send my men to help them. An immense amount of timber will be needed for the temple I'm going to build will be very large and magnificent. I will pay your men 100,000 bushels of crushed wheat, 100,000 bushels of barley, 110,000 gallons of wine, and 110,000 gallons of olive oil. King Haram sent this letter 
to re a reply to Solomon. It is because the Lord loves his people that he has made you their king. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who made the heavens and the earth. He has given David a wise son, gifted with skill and understanding, who will build a temple for the Lord and a royal palace for himself. I am sending you a master craftsman named Haram Ebi. He is a brilliant man, the son of a woman from Dan in Israel. His father is from Tyre. He is skillful at making things of gold, silver, bronze, and iron. He also knows about stonework, carpentry, and weaving. He is an expert in dyeing purple, blue, and scarlet cloth and in working with linen. He is also an engraver and can follow any design given to him. He will work with your craftsmen and those appointed by my lord David, your father. Send along the wheat, barley, olive oil, and wine that you mentioned. We will cut whatever timber you need from the Lebanon mountains and will float the logs in rafts down the coast of the Mediterranean Sea to Joppa. From there, you can transport the logs up to Jerusalem. Solomon took a census of all foreigners in the land of Israel, like the census his father had taken, and he counted 153,600. He enlisted 70,000 of them as common laborers, 80,000 as stonecutters in the hill country, and 3,600 as foremen. Chapter 3, Solomon Builds the Temple. So Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to Solomon's father, King David. The temple was built on the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite, the site that David had selected. The construction began in mid-spring during the fourth year of Solomon's reign. The foundation for the temple of God was 90 feet long and 30 feet wide. The foyer at the front of the temple... Um, was 30 feet wide, running across the entire width of the temple. The inner walls of the foyer and the ceiling were overlaid with pure gold. The roof of the foyer was 30 feet high. The main room of the temple was paneled with cypress wood overlaid with pure gold and decorated with carvings of palm trees and chains. The walls of the temple were decorated with beautiful jewels and with pure gold from the land of Parvaim. All the walls, beams, doors, and the threshings thresholds throughout the temple were overlaid with gold and figures of cherubim were carved on the walls. The most holy place was 30 feet wide corresponding to the width of the temple and it was also 30 feet deep. Its interior was overlaid with about 23 tons of pure gold. They, were, they used gold nails that weighed about 20 ounces each. Wow. The walls of the upper rooms were also overlaid with pure gold. Solomon made Two figures shaped like cherubim and overlaid them with gold. These were placed in the most holy place. The total wing span of the two cherubim sitting side by side was 30 feet. <clears throat> One wing of the first figure was seven and a half feet long and it touched the temple wall. The other wing, also seven and a half feet long, touched one of the wings of the second figure. In the same way, the second figure had one wing seven and a half feet long that touched the opposite wall. The other wing, also seven and a half feet long, Touched the wing of the first figure. So the wingspan of both room together was 30 feet. They both stood and faced out toward the main room of the temple. Across the entrance of the most holy place, Solomon hung a curtain made of fine linen and blue, purple, and scarlet yarn with figures of trubum embroidered on it. For the front of the temple, Solomon made two pillars that were 27 feet tall, each topped by a capital extending upward another 7.5 feet. He made a network of interwoven chains and used them to decorate the tops of the pillars. He also made 100 decorative pomegranates and attached them to the chains. Then he set up the two pillars at the entrance of the temple, one to the south of the entrance and the other to the north. He named the one on the south Jackin and the one on the north Boaz. Or Boaz. Okay. Psalm chapter 78. Verses 25 through 48. Okay, so 25 through 48. Okay, which 48? 48. Okay. They ate the food of angels. God gave them all they could hold. He released the east wind in the heavens and guided the south wind by his mighty power. He rained down meat as thick as dust, birds as plentiful as the sands along the seashore. He caused the birds to fall within their camp and all around their tents. The people ate their fill. He gave them what they wanted. 
But before they finished eating this food they had craved, while the meat was yet in their mouths, the anger of God rose against them, and he killed their strongest men. He struck down the finest of Israel's young men, but in spite of this, the people kept on sinning. They refused to believe in his miracles, so he ended their lives in failure and gave them years of terror. When God killed some of them, the rest finally sought him. They repented and turned to God. Then they remembered that God was their rock, that their Redeemer was the Most High, that they followed him only with their words. They lied to him with their tongues. Their hearts were not loyal to him. They did not keep his covenant. Yet he was merciful and forgave their sins and didn't destroy them all. Many a time he held back his anger and did not unleash his fury. For he remembered that they were nearly mortal, gone in a moment like a breath of wind, never to return. Oh, how often they rebelled against him in the desert and grieved his heart in the wilderness. Again and again they tested God's patience and frustrated the Holy One of Israel. They forgot about his power and how he rescued them from their enemies. They forgot his miraculous signs in Egypt, his wonders on the plain of Zone, for he turned their rivers into blood so no one could drink from the streams. He sent vast swarms of flies to consume them and hordes of frogs to ruin them. He gave their crops to caterpillars, their harvest was consumed by locusts. He destroyed their grapevines with hail and shattered their sycamores with sleet. He abandoned their cattle to the hill, their livestock to bolts of lightning. Okay, in 1 Corinthians... Chapter 13. If I could speak in any language in heaven or on earth, but didn't love others, I would only be making meaningless noise like a loud gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I knew all the mysteries of the future, and knew everything about everything, but didn't love others, what good would I be? And if I had the gift of faith so that I could speak to a mountain and make it move, without love I would be no good to anybody. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would be of no value whatsoever. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Love does not demand its own way. Love is not irritable, and it keeps no record of when it has been wronged. It is never glad about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Love will last forever, but prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will all disappear. Now we know only a little, and even the gift of prophecy reveals little, but when the end comes, these special gifts will all disappear. It's like this. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child does. When I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly as in a poor mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God knows me now. There are three things that will endure, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. That's a very popular verse read in weddings. And it's also... Part, part of those are lyrics of um, a song on Caleb. It's a very, very popular chapter in First Corinthians. Okay, that is all for today's reading. We'll see you next time.